Yeah, I, uh, again, the concept that humans are, of course, much older than what science generally feels. Uh, and this is one of the things about the book of Man and Evolution by G.D. Peruker was to bring evidence that humans go back much farther than we realize. And if you read The Secret Doctrine, that uh, humanity is older, much older than uh, we realize, is becoming more and more true. And uh, uh, there's evidence now that goes back to about 2,500,000 years, years ago that they can have, read, uh, have found evidence of humans. Uh, whereas just a, a few decades ago, this uh, was considerably less. Uh, the point uh, uh, that Bruker especially brought out to be more specific and anatomical, I think should be brought up uh, because this uh, shows some of the primitive, and I mean by the word primitive, I'm talking about the original Latin meaning coming from primus, meaning first, that humans do seem to be much older, and you can see anatomical evidence to indicate that much of the human physical vehicle is, is very primitive compared to other mammals or other animals uh, that we have found. Uh, if you go to the secret doctrine, uh, the first humans were considered to be more astral, what they call the first root race. Uh, they had vehicles or, that were very much ethereal, they were not really physical, and uh, this occurred over millions of years. Eventually they became more and more physical, but also much larger and, if you will, more like cells, if you will, in the, in the atmosphere or the earth going back. It was the big changes occurred during the end of the second root race and the first uh, part of the third root race. At this time, uh, it was thought that uh, the humans uh, were becoming more physical, gelatinous, if you will, and uh, had control of their uh, cells, if you will, but not total control as they do have for the most part now. Some of these would shed, if you will, like eggs and uh, form other uh, entities, not only human, but also animals and would influence the plant and vegetable uh, world. Uh, because the control, the will of a human being was less dealing with cells at this time. This is in the secret doctrine, which you again can agree with or not. Uh, it was at that time that especially the different animal species were thought to occur. They had their own desire, because every, every entity in the universe has free will some more than others, they were able to develop their own areas from human influence, human cells literally, uh, for lack of a better word, I'm sure there are better, and that this uh, uh, developed into a variety of specializations in different plant animals especially, but also influenced the plants and minerals. At the middle of the third root race, which was something like, if you will, uh, 18 million years ago, uh, it was th this time humans had the separation of the sexes. Uh, the third root, middle of the third root race. Yeah, well, okay. All right, three and a half on the root race. And it was at this time that it was thought that there was a separation of the sexes. And uh, so uh, this is the time also when it was thought that the first uh, apes, if you will, not apes, but the, the uh, ape-like creatures, if you will, anthropoid, uh, if you will, uh, originated. Uh, the human race was not, it was more like children at that time. They were not totally enlightened by the, what they call the Manasaputras, the, uh, the uh, sons of light, if you will, the sun. And, uh, and there was uh, some miscegenation or uh, there was uh, a reproduction, sexual reproduction with entities that were similar to humans that turned out again to be more like, if you will, the monkeys, etc. This was the thought. This is the theory. And again, 
we're going to get into some kind of evidence showing that humans now have some of the more primitive or first aspects to it. The middle of the fourth root race, if I can say that, <laughs> the Atlanteans, uh, this was a time uh, where the humans were fully conscious and those degenerate Atlanteans or fourth root race had sexual relationships with animals and did produce the gorillas, et cetera, et cetera. So this isn't a, exactly a polite thing to talk about in social or religious society, if you will, but it, if it is true, it's true. And uh, again, what evidence do we have to support this? What evidence do we have looking at the human physical and the embryo, et cetera, to back it up? So, Erwin, if you would go really quickly, because we're, this was a slide with a long paper, and we're going to go through, and I'll just keep going, and I will I'll stop you whenever. Okay. Now, one more slide, please. Okay, stop, please. So, what was listed by G.D. Peruker were specific anatomical features of a human that date back well before the apes and show, again, a very primitive first, in that context, uh, ability to see with the human being, that it came it developed this even before, certainly the apes, etc. One of these is the premaxilla, which is this area up in here. And uh, it again showed, next slide please, uh, that it dif differed radically from other primates. Primates, I don't want to get into a lot of technical terms because this, this talk does have a lot of technical terms. And I don't want to get into that because of time, if nothing else. But they basically uh, deal with... Uh, similar uh, animals that are close, that have a relationship with the human in structural form. And I'll leave it at that. It'll get more specific, but I don't want to do that unless I have to. Okay, so next slide, please. So anyway, they, they, uh, 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 the premaxilla dates way back before many of the primates, many of the mammalians, if you will, uh, those which are breastfed, et cetera, et cetera, the various animals and so forth. That's one, and it'll go on and on. We've got a number of examples of this, and again, I think it needs to be listed because even though this is somewhat tedious and uh, technical, uh, we talk philosophically here, and this is wonderful, but we need something concrete evidence saying, yes, humans show a very primitive, a very first uh, ability of developing m many of the organs and much part of the physical body. Uh, another very interesting area is the foot, uh, especially in regards to the apes. Uh, embryology uh, is, uh, the embryo period is the first two months of gestation, of, be, of the pregnancy. It's the first two months. By the end of that time, a human being can definitely be seen as a human being. They're about two inches tall. You can see the feet, you can see the eyes, etc., etc., etc. Now, uh, Darwin and Hegel, who was a German counterpart of Darwin, uh, pushed a, a very, uh, one, of their, uh, one of their sayings that was put on a pedestal and worshipped was, and I'm sure you've all heard this, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. You all heard that, right? No, of course not. Uh, ontogeny means by looking at the development of a race, uh, you can also see this development in, uh, I mean, by ontogeny, I'm sorry, ontogeny by looking at the development of an embryo in the first two months, you will see the evolution and development of a race. And uh, we will stick with the human race, which is phy phylogeny. The phyla is a larger human race, and the ontogeny or ontog means the small embryo. By examining them, you have a fairly good idea of the whole evolution of that race. For instance, uh, when you, you can go uh, eight weeks is a, is a time for uh, the embryonic period. At seven weeks, a human being has a tail. So you see the reptile influence. And before that, you will see the fish 
or, or a Piscean uh, influence. And you'll see earlier and earlier and earlier. But the interesting thing about the foot and the hand, the apes and all the primates, uh, uh, the, uh, the anthropoids, if you will, the apes, the chimpanzees, et cetera, et cetera, their feet look like hands. If you look at their feet, uh, you will see that the third toe, and the first toe is the large toe, so the third toe is the longest toe. You also notice that their first toe or is uh, what they call prehensile. It goes like this. And you look at the hand, and which is the longest finger? It's the third finger. You see that the, human, that the primates and anthropoids' feet all look like hands. And they naturally walk on fours. Oh, they can stand, they can walk on their two feet, yes. But it isn't the way they naturally or typically do it. Okay? Why is this important? Because, again, one of the big things of Darwin, and again, this is what they worshipped, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. If you have, if humans came from apes, the feet, which are extremely important, because we walk properly upright, is very important. This distinguishes considerable about the apes. We should have feet that look like hands before they turn into what our typical foot is, which does not look like a hand. First toe and the third. I've never seen a third toe the longest in a foot. You will not see this, and as I say, the last week of the, 20, of the uh, uh, eight weeks, uh, the human has a tail, meaning it's very far back. And during this last week, at no time does the foot look like a hand. At the end of that last week, it looks like a foot and never changes. Now, if this were the case, if we did come from apes, then it should look like a hand first. All right. So this is very strong anatomical evidence showing that humans did not come from apes, but that we came before them. At least a very strong anatomical statement. Next, next, please. Okay, next, please. The uh, peroneus tertius is a muscle uh, that goes um, from uh, here down to your ankle. This is very important because none of the primates and uh, really uh, uh, certainly none of the apes have this muscle. Uh, it is important for standing up erect. It is, keeps the toe from turning in, et cetera, et cetera. None of them have it. Humans have it. It's early. It's right there. Another bit of evidence. Next, please. I will go through these fairly quickly. The aorta is the largest artery in the body. It comes from the heart. It comes right out of the heart. And what does it look like? The duck pill platypus. That's the closest it comes to, which is the most primitive and lowest of the mammals. It should look like an ape or something else, you know, very recent. But it goes back uh, many uh, millions of years of evolution. Next, please. Okay. Oh, yes. Encephalization, or the brain, and the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, primarily. Humans, this is where humans shine. And this is where we are. I mean, we are dealing primarily with the mind. This is what makes us different than the other animals. And we're, that's where we shine. We uh, are, are, for instance, what does it say? The next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, I'm not seeing it. But the, uh, maybe we missed it. But anyway, the bottom line is that the human brain, considering the size of a human compared to a gorilla or any of the anthropoid apes, is about two or three times larger. I forget the exact amount. You may know, Hank. Three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. Thank you, Hank. Three and a half times larger than an ape, which is much considered larger than we are. And certainly no primate has anywhere near the, if, and I'm talking about proportion of size, et cetera, et cetera, that, they, that humans do. 
goes very much consistent and very consistent with the fact that we are mainly, our evolution is mainly the mind. Next, please. The appendix, similar to the marsupials, which are like the um, um, kangaroos, etc., etc. That's the closest it looks to. It doesn't look like any of the other primates or monkeys or anything else. It goes back way to the kangaroos. That's the way it looks the most. Showing, again, a very early primitive aspect to it. Next slide. Next. Uh, the pectoris minor, a muscle that goes up in here in this. I won't get into the details on it, but again, same thing. Exceedingly primitive. Goes back way, way back. Way, way back. It's not near the apes. It's not near any of the more recent mammals. Uh, our, our anthropoid uh, uh, animals. Next, please. Tongue. Very, very simple, very, very basic. No monkey shows anywhere near and is so primitive of a man, uh, as, as man. The tongue is very primitive. Very first, very basic, very down. Next, please. The kidney. Same story. Same story. Next. The human skull. Very, very primitive. Very simple, very basic. The human skeletal, the muscles, the nose, the nasal bones. Very, very simple and primitive. The teeth, you know? Next, please. So, again, Dr. Schwindler, who is one of the things, so forth, so that the, the very conservative, that there's much more specialization in the animals. And very, very much different than the very primitive and simple. Humans, really, when it comes to animals, I mean, is there any animal that doesn't have a sense or something else that is much better or more developed or specialized than us? When it comes to, oh, well, we're, you know, I have all the respect in the world for the athletes, etc. But is there any animal that you, I mean, are there not a, probably a number of animals that can't swim or fly or run or whatever better than we do? We're very primitive. Very basic, very simple. Next, please. Okay. Here, the embryo, again, from, which is from 19 to 24 days. Again, the total amount is um, your four weeks. Has a strong resemblance to the primitive extinct vertebrate fish 300 million years ago. 300 million years ago, the embryo. All right, next slide. All right. Again, in the 56th day, the tail's gone. The tail goes very far back. Next slide, please. Genitalia don't really develop until 12 weeks. Uh, again, going somewhat more with the separation of the root races and the uh, so-called Lemurians. Next, please. Okay, I think uh, that's about it. I want to go on that. Uh, so we'll go through the rest of those and then we'll go to the stem cells. All right. So this is the evidence that G.D. Peruker gave to show there's anatomical black and white, no question that most of human structure is very early, much earlier than the apes. Again, the feet we have no relationship to the embryonic period with the apes. And as I say, the not very socially acceptable aspect of how apes came about and humans messing around, if you will, uh, is something which polite society doesn't want to talk too much about, but it probably happened. Uh, and this goes along with what I've just said. Yes, we can have questions anywhere along the way. Uh, Mike. Is this the mic? <laughs> I got the mic. <laughs> this is a very fascinating uh, subject. There's a museum, by the way, downtown. It's called the Museum of Man, and it shows uh, apes, and it shows progressions of what they think evolution looked like in a progress rather than starting and falling back and go or going forward. It's kind of interesting if you're interested in seeing that. There's a book out called The Lemurian Scrolls. Are you familiar with that one? The Lemurian Scrolls. Uh, in any way, this one, uh, the author claims to be developed in a certain way to read the Akashic Record of Light. 
and tells a story that people came from different planets in, in like karmic groupings to come to Earth. To up, we, ca we came as people and they took on various forms to lift it into, you know, human expression and superhuman that we know as avatars are a higher degree initiations. He tells a story from that vantage and that um, t uh, people used to levitate at will is his claim and they had to learn to ingest food to make a grosser body and his claim is at some point they used to use milk and they used to throw up, you know, until they could learn to ingest it to make the body dense enough to have a physical body is his claim and then at some point people started eating meat, they, they over, um, they got into the desire body too much as he explains it, and they started eating meat and taking on animal characteristics, which was, it's in the karmic tendency now of the planet. Mm -hmm. So he has a line about evolution I had not read before. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, your talk is very interesting to see, you know, what, how it actually happened. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Truth. So, um, any other questions before I move on? Yeah, <laughs> we'll give you that mic. I'm doing a good job. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if there was any ontological study on the foot of the ape. Does it start out as a human foot and then change to an ape foot? Not that I'm, not that I'm aware of. Again, Hank would, uh, Hank's a biologist, and uh, he would probably know more about it. I'm just a family doc. You know. And, <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if you know about that, Hank. Hi. Whoops, that doesn't work too well. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I it's singing, but not giving my voice. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but when you look more generally, then uh, I think you will uh, uh, see a little bit the same uh, fact that you also already see with uh, just newly born uh, anthropoid apes. They resemble the human being in a certain way by, uh, yeah. in fact, all young animals have a little likeness of human beings, just as what the Kotswede Brücke said. But that is the general answer you already knew, but uh, the details, I don't know. So I expect uh, the same uh, in the embryological phase. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think that's good. Now, I, one of the areas I think of interest, too, that we should talk about uh, is stem cells. And as you can see, I'm taking this from a very legitimate source. I mean, Time magazine. I, let's give them credit. They, you know, they got a lot of staff and they check things out. And actually, they, I think they did a good article on st stem cells. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Right. So what are they? And I'm going to just go ahead and read that off. Stem cells are nature's master cells, capable of generating every one of the many different cells that make up the body. They have the ability to self-renew, which means that they are theoretically immortal and can continue to divide forever if provided with enough nutrients. Because they are so plastic, they hold enormous pro promise as the basis for new treatments and even cures for disorders ranging from Parkinson's to heart disease to diabetes and even spinal cord injury. Next slide. Let me go through some of the basic things about stem cells here. Um, first, the embryo, again, is fertilized, is an egg which is fertilized, or cloned. This can be done artificially, or what they call in vitro. Vitro means in life, or artificial life in this case. It's done as opposed to the regular sexual union. It's done in this respect. To form an embryo, and so forth. Then it begins to divide. Next slide. 
From the first to the fifth days, the embryo divides into more and more cells and forms a hollow ball of cells called a blastocyst. Next slide. And from the fifth to seventh day, the embryonic stem cells begin to form along the inside of the blastocyst and create the inner cell mass. Next. The stem cells are, are scraped away and grown on a later feeder cells and cultured medium. Next, please. Tissue production, the groups of stem cells are nurtured under the specialized conditions with different recipes and nutrients and grown and can become any body, any of the body's more than 200 various tissues. Next. Muscle cells could replace damaged heart. Next. So here are some of the uh, other aspects. Why are they useful? Uh, adult stem cells, now mind you, are not the same thing, of course, as embryos. Uh, this is taken from adults and definitely a, a different type of cell. They exist in many major tissues, including blood, skin, and brain. They can be coaxed to produce more cells of a specific lineage and do not have to be extracted from embryos. Down, down side, uh, they can generate only a limited number of cell types and they are difficult to grow in culture. Next, please. Umbilical cord cells. Although they are primarily made up of blood stem cells, they also contain stem cells that can turn into bone, cartilage, heart, muscle, and brain and liver, liver tissue. Like adult stem cells, they are harvested without the need of embryos. An umbil negative and neg on the umbilical cord is not very long and does doesn't hold enough cells to treat an adult. Next. Um, <clears throat> leftover are what they call in vitro fertilized embryos. These are the ones, again, where those, uh, uh, those couples that want to have children but are having trouble getting children, they are put in, in the test tube, if you will, for lack of a better word, and the uh, sperm and the egg are joined together and to form artificially and then placed back into the uterus to hopefully take effect in the mother that wants to have the child. Uh, there are more than 400,000 embryos created during an in vitro fertilization life frozen in the clinical tanks in the U.S. Many of them will be discarded, so the embryonic stem cells that exist inside them could be salvaged. However, the breezing, bree, freezing process may make it harder to extract stem cells. Some of the embryos were the weakest ones created by infertile couples and may not yield high quality stem cells. Next slide. Finally, uh, nuclear transferred embryos. These embryos are created using the technique that created Dolly, the clone sheep. I don't know if you know that. Stem cells can be custom made by inserting a patient's skin cell into the hollow or egg, egg, human egg, any resulting therapies would not run the risk of immune rejection. The process has not yet been successfully completed with human cells, and it requires an enormous amount of fresh human eggs, which are difficult to attain. All right, I think that's enough. I think you get the idea of a stem cell now. All right, so what has this got to do with what we were talking about? Uh, again, the primitive, the, the, the fact that human, the human primitive first cells coming from the embryo uh, have the ability to go into a number of different directions. Um, it is uh, another example of the, the very basic um, product to produce that the humans have in general, but especially, of course, for humans. Uh, but this can be done with others. This gets into, of course, a lot of ethical questions. Uh, it is wonderful. It's, it has some very marvelous aspects. Anything that can heal pain and suffering, I'm interested in. But of course, it gets into the ethical aspect. And why this is also important is exactly what we're talking about today. If humans are the, you might say, spiritual aspects of this planet, that they certainly influenced virtually all the animals and plants, not created them, but influenced them, affected them, came from them, and again, for a reason, they have this influence. And again, not from creation, but because humans were on the earth chain. I mean, the, <laughs> the moon chain. What were the humans on the moon, moon chain? 
Where were they? What were they doing? Anybody? There are two basic categories uh, of humans right now. We were either humans on the lunar chain that did not complete the 49 fires, or we were not human and became human in the first three and a half rounds on the Earth. Okay. I'm getting some exercise here. I love it. You know, after sitting down all day, it really gets it moving. But anyway, all right. So. Going to the second, they were not human. What were they? Well, what were we? What were we? I suppose we were lower than human. <laughs> well, I suppose we would not be a plant. We would be an animal. But, uh, what specific? What specific type of animal? I think you'd have to be on the lunar chain to make that analogy. <laughs> Any other any other comments? I'll only make it more difficult. <laughs> you have to bring in the subject of monads. Animal monad. Animal monads in. We were animal monads in. In. The humans at that time. Yeah. What do you mean in? In? Where did the Dion Shohans, the lower Dion Shohans of this earth chain, come from? I haven't asked them. <laughs> I have their email address, but anyway, but, but seriously. No, okay, I'll let you talk, but let me say my spiel first. The lower Dion, Dion Shohans, and there's three levels for this earth chain were humans during the moon chain. We were, and we can hear debates, we were the ma animal monads of those humans. We were the uh, comma, the, I don't know, the ego, the shadow, the whatever it was that you're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm bad on term, of, of the, we were, the, the animal monads in us, were those things that are bringing us down, those entities that are bringing us down and our negative side and our selfish side, et cetera, et cetera. We were to the humans on the earth chain. Now, we have to lift the animal monads up to the human so that we can move to the... This is what it's all about. This is evolution. This is the bottom line that we need. It's not just, oh, we, well, it's nice not to be selfish. But we cannot advance unless we help the animal monad in us. And again, we're talking about consciousness. You're not talking so much about dimension. You're talking about position. We have seven states of consciousness in us. We mainly deal with the lower common monics. But there are other states of consciousness that are in us that we are part of us which we fully, we certainly don't understand entirely. But I throw that in on the animal monad. I think it has a lot to do with why humans have so much influence on this earth. It did not create them, but it was part of them, so to speak. As we, again, the human being is not what we see in front of us. Our astral and our physical and so forth, astral state of consciousness Again, I'm going through GDP. This isn't something, of course, I could say the wrong thing, so please correct me. Is the earth. The astral state of consciousness is the earth. The lower monastic or the monastic aspect is the earth chain. The buddhic is the solar system. And the atmic or divine is the galaxy. This is the real human. Of course, we're not evolved to all that yet, but we will. Uh, and it'll only take another three and a half rounds, whatever it is, a few billion years. But anyway, uh, now I'll be I'll be nice to you, John. Let you talk. <laughs> no, I'll wait till Saturday. <laughs>
I don't really have any argument, basically, except that maybe we can say the animal monads of the moon were in the humans in the same respect that the animals today are part of the humans also. In that respect, I'd say that's probably true, and that's why eating meat is really cannibalism. So uh, other than that, uh, I do not believe the Dian Choans came from the lunar chain uh, because, and I'll speak more on Saturday, it's clear that uh, the, the uh, man on the moon <laughs> who uh, filled, finished up the 49 fires became the lunar petries which were not high enough to stay in the Diani Chahanic kingdom and Blavatsky says they're now in the Mahar Loka of the objective physical plane. So uh, the uh, Dian Chowans must have come from even more spiritual and uh, chains further back than the lunar chain. But other than that, it's purely technical. <laughs> well, everybody's entitled to their opinion. <laughs> GDP says what I just said. Do you have anything else? In fact, so I was going to cover it in a minute. Uh, the theosophical meaning of the stem cell. Theosophical meaning of stem cell. I'm not sure I can give you a real theosophical, other than it is, um, <laughs> I don't know if I can give you too much more in depth on that. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> what's more important is what is humanity going to do with all this? And uh, I have some real concerns about ethics here. Especially, of course, if it's taken from the embryos, and especially if they're aborted embryos. Um, and I'll even stretch it further here and say about organ transplants. Um, I don't question, I take for granted that everyone that does this gets a transplant, takes the embryo or stem cell, I take for granted that they're doing it because they want to do something good. I start with that. But one's intention, a good intention, doesn't necessarily mean you're doing the right thing. And seeing humanity as such, and believe me, there's some very wonderful and beautiful people and kind people in this world, but when it gets into money and so forth and so on, I have a certain amount of cynicism that this will be used improperly. Anyone that gets an organ transplant has to take medication to uh, destroy, basically, or repel their immune system because the immune system doesn't want it. Does that tell you something? Now, as I say, the people that are doing it are doing what they think is right. But remember, these organs have their own energies. They come from another person, et cetera, et cetera. The stem cells, especially if they're embryos, these are human. Do we have a right to take a human and put it in another human and say, oh, well, it's going to make them feel good? I think you get the point. These things are very questionable, and that's why there's so much religious debate about it. And I think a lot of it is legitimate. Uh, so it's not, I'm not going so deeply into that, Ken, I'm sorry. I think it needs to be brought up because it sees this whole picture, the ethical picture. Hum humanity and humans have to realize they are spiritual beings. And this is what GDP was trying to bring out, man and evolution. This was his whole bottom line. We are not here to survival of the fittest. We saw what happened uh, last century with survival of the fittest. And a lot of that was influenced by Darwin, believe me, as well as the eight the 19th century, the 1800s. A lot of this thought was brought out and strongly brought out by the Darwinian that survival of the fittest. This is why this point is extremely important. There is some evidence, yes, I admit, you know, it's not black and white. We don't have, we don't go back, we don't have 15 million years or 18 million years ago evidence. Yeah, if the Lanteans did exist, that was like their high point was 9 million years ago. What happens to something under the ocean after 100 years? 
you're getting my point. Much of this was lost. Uh, the ocean destroys, and so forth and so on. But it's just a lot of this adding up. It's a lot of things adding up. And the bottom line, again, GDP and the Theosophical Society and Catherine Ting and everybody else wants humanity to realize they're spiritual beings and we better be responsible. And we do have an effect on all the animals and plants around us. Our energy is them and we do have, they did come from us to some extent, depending on how you want to explain that. And therefore, uh, how we act, let alone our mind, we're talking about the mind, your thoughts are living entities. They're elementals. You can call them whatever. There's other words. These are living entities that come out and influence the rest of the, of the, of the globe for sure. And we better realize where we are and stop fooling around and, you know, being so selfish. And this, these are just some examples. Thank you. Are we out of time? Okay, then there's more questions. Oh, actually, this is a, a research question. Uh, it's because I'm not familiar. So recently, well, I think it's fairly well known recently in the last few years, they've uh, discovered uh, Neanderthal DNA in Europeans. It's pretty well established, 2 or 3% uh, from, in, you know, interconnection between uh, Cro-Magnon and, no, early Europeans and, and Neanderthal, yeah? Anyway. But recently I read, which is more interesting, that uh, they have discovered 2 or 3% DNA in native of Africa of an unknown, n not, not yet found uh, ancestor that is not anywhere else but is not in these, you know, with the idea that everyone came out of Africa in modern uh, theory, they rushed to say, well, it had to happen then very recently, even though there's no, uh, arche no archaeological evidence of, of who these other beings were or they're gone or whatever. Additionally, there's also uh, 2 or 3% DNA in Pacific Islanders from a Siberian ancestor. But these are, you know, so I have a couple of thoughts about what this might be, but I thought I would just mention it, because it's, I think theosophically there's an answer there. But I won't get into that now. Well, there's two thoughts, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, it's interesting, and I, I will suspect that there'll be uh, maybe four more remnants, because Peruker made it very clear that of the original prototypical humanities, there are none left but traces. So I'm wondering if these DNA traces are not, really have anything to do with, say, Neanderthal or this whoever these other two are, but are actually much earlier, much, much earlier traces, you know? Thank you. Let's see. <laughs> Working off my dinner here. Yeah, on the uh, stem cells, I read a teaching by, there's a teaching released by Maitreya, the fifth Buddha, who comes back as the Christ in all these roles, the Ahamadi, the um, Messiah. He comes back in, he's released a book called The Laws of Life, and his teaching, he says that playing with mutation is wrong and, and that there, the natural process of evolution should occur. This is what he taught. And then another a book I read that all the great books talk about the truth, which is we call God or the mystery or faith in God or something better yet to come, births the spirit from our form as we serve God rather than our fellow man, although we serve our fellow man as well as our service to God, and that the spirit then guides the evolution through Christ's body as linked up to the Father, and um, that, that they hold that plan of evolution for us and are guiding us. And so to play with evolution here, to manipulate the form, um, seems like it's way out of uh, alignment with all these teachings that, that you read in these books. I don't know what the feedback would be to the scientist who doesn't read these teachings. 
I think another comment my Trey made in one of his teachings was to ask scientists to look for the root cause of things rather than playing with the effects of things. And that's the law of cause and effect. And he's had different statements to scientists that where they sh should be self-explanatory, which leads them to books like Alice Bailey and Theosophy to start to begin those studies. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, Richard, um, going back to stem cells, I always ask myself, if you look, and I learned a lot from uh, Hank Bezemer about that, if you look to the stem cells, and let's say the capacity they have, like act universal, uh, able to create, let's say, the start of organs, and even able uh, to create different type of organs, and if they start to do that, they attract a lower type of cells that cannot do the university behave, but only a part of the trick. And so you see a type of hierarchy starting by uh, growing organs or, let's say, the development of organs. For me, the um, question is, if the third fundamental of the secret doctrine is true, that as above, as below, and vice versa, where do we see, or how do you describe then that behavior of that cells in universal terms? You see what I'm trying to say? What type of consciousness is on the top? What type of, if I want to project that on another level of analogy, what type of consciousness is on the top working and able to create systems, universal, is even able to create other type of systems, working with lower consciousness. Because for me, this is also a very important um, aspect of the um, teaching of emanation. So I look now in the theosophical world, where can I find a universal description of that behavior of the stem cell? Do you have any idea? And again, as you say, it's universal, it's more general, it's more primitive. It's more one, it's the first. Um, ability to go in multiple directions. And uh, of course, there's stem cells for humans, but there's all stem cells for animals. In the same context of being able to form the whole thing, starting from... With the same type, with the same type of properties. Um, no. Of course, animals cannot. Uh, no, no, within, the animal world, within the animal world, they can do the same as the stem cells within the human world. Yeah, uh, to my knowledge, and again, I'm no expert on this, uh, so I won't uh, carve this in stone. But as I mentioned, uh, or as there was mentioned in that article, uh, I think it was Dolly the sheep was cloned from, a, uh, again, a stem cell, if you will, or from an embryo. And so I would take it that the animals have that ability too, but I, again, I don't know for sure about that. Yeah. Mm. Covered so much material here, I want to respond to. I can't remember all of it, but my understanding of stem, cell, stem cells is um, that they're very plastic and that they can become anything with a proper coaxing. So I would be curious to know if an animal stem cell could be coaxed into being functional for human without it taking on the properties of the animal because it is so plastic. That's the, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting we do that, I'm just wondering about that because when Dolly was made, it was from, I think, another sheep. So clearly it was going to be a sheep um, my understanding with the human embryo is that on the cellular level, at least while it's an embryo, it really has the potential to be any life. That whatever patterning hasn't kicked in to say, I'm going to be a chicken or a human or a, a bird. That, that happens at a certain point. I don't know exactly when that is, which of course brings in the whole ethical discussion of when does life begin? When are they cells and then when do they... Um, connect with the soul and, and become a life, 
at least where a human being is concerned. I don't know the answers to those things. I think that's where a lot of the debate comes up as to the ethics of certain kinds of practices. Just wondering what you thought about that. Um, I'll stay here in case you have another comment. Um, yes, uh, definitely other animal tissues have been put in humans, like valves for heart from cows, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I would not be terribly surprised, again, I'm no expert, but I would not be terribly surprised that they could use animal stem cells to form organs in a human being. I'm no expert, but I wouldn't be surprised. And frankly, um, as I told you, this is where we're getting into ethics, and this is one of the big questions. Is it right to put that in a human being, especially as a stem cell? Yeah, How is that going to affect the human being, which what we're dealing with mainly here, of course, is the physical. That's what we're dealing with is the physical. But if there is truth to theosophy and, and other religions and thought that, that a human being is spiritual, too, uh, we're dealing with the low end. And it was really in, in reference to health in general. Um, I'm going to go over here. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Um, this gets into a very broad question. Again, um, disease, as a general rule, is the body and its energies working something out karmically. Uh, we are, the physical is the last step, so to speak. And the skin is the most peripheral and the louder part of the human being. So when things work out in the skin, that's where you want them. Although, that's when everybody gets upset because they can see it and they don't look good. But that's another story. The bottom line is this. You're dealing with the physical, and this is where it's so dangerous. Why, you know, this is the thing. We have a very basic, we're dealing with inductive thinking, coming from the particular to the universal, or deductive from the universal to the particular. This is where they clash. If the human being is just the physical, okay, all these things, well, what's the big deal? But if they do have the spiritual aspect, you're adding, adding a lower entity of evolution, especially a very strong one if it's a stem cell. What's that going to do to that individual and the karma of that individual? I personally probably couldn't tell you, even if I knew the individual. But you see that, and again, these other organ transplants, et cetera. Do we really see the whole picture of what's going to happen in the long run? How many people have had blood transfusions and then developed a different personality, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and so forth and so on. We're dealing with very dangerous ground. And before we had the blood transfusions and the, and the uh, organ trans, now we're going to the stem cells, especially if they're coming from embryos. I'm not so much concerned about a human uh, otherwise, except again, there is not part of that human being. There's more overlay, especially the embryo. So we're getting into a lot of these ethical things, and frankly, um, again, uh, I don't trust the ethics of, of medicine in this world at this point. I've been in homeopathy too long to do that, you know. I've seen, um, seen some, a lot of suppression, a lot of things pushed deeper in the body, and this will definitely do it also. It may help the individual, and again, you have to look at each individual case, and some are more than others, and so forth, but I think you get the point. Did I answer your question at least as well as I could? Yeah, I was just curious to know what you thought about that. That's my thought, which may or may not be right. This is uh, partly a question, because uh, I didn't follow it up at the time I was reading about it, but, and Hank may know, or you may know Richard, or someone else, that I remember reading that some of the cloned uh, animals were aging faster. And that they were aging from the, seemingly as if they were beginning their age at the age of where the stem cell was taken from, from the age of that animal, which I thought was really remarkably interesting theosophically. Like, where is the, how does the stem cell hold the memory clock of the age somehow? It seemed like. And this may also relate to what, again, does the stem cell hold in memory when used in general? Now, I'm not going to talk about Frankenstein. <laughs> hey, 
uh, a little addition to uh, what uh, already is known is that when you put a stem cell out of its normal organism, that somehow there's always going something strange. Because his, uh, yeah, he is also in somehow related to the higher functions of the human being. Eh? So he is as part of a kind of chain of, uh, of cooperating beings. Now you somehow they always get it out their normal hierarchy, their normal unity, and then they do something with it and they place it again back. And uh, until now, each time there is a kind of little surprise later, or uh, they may discover it later. They tried, for instance, stem cells of the peoples themselves, uh, from, for instance, uh, your own. So they get it out, they put uh, a, a few genes in it, uh, so that the ill person wouldn't be uh, would would get a healthy cell, but that period that it was outside his normal uh, organism was also the period that the stem cell, in fact, yeah, uh, followed its own character without the yeah, the, the harmonizing or the ordering influence. Then you put it back, and now, now, now they know, they already know, that one of the so many people get uh, cancer. And uh, so you, I think that uh, another thing which is also very interesting is the cloning thing uh, of uh, Ken. Is uh, They know that when you uh, get a, a clone, so, so you, you try to just start with one cell and uh, without the normal way of, uh, of multiplying of, uh, of, uh, with just with uh, an Excel and an, uh, and an, uh, and an uh, yeah, seed, yeah, sperm. Well, they know already that there are very strange things uh, inside the cells going, while, for instance, a sheep may look almost like a normal sheep. But when you look to the molecular level, very strange things happen. And that has all to do that uh, normally the egg cell and the, and the sperm gives uh, two aspects of a complete being, and now you only have one of the two. So there is a kind of balance. Uh, and, uh, well, I think, uh, yeah, and, and I had perhaps, if, if I may, or, uh, when uh, Herman asked his question about uh, what analogy you can take with uh, the germ cell, I, at that moment, I had to think about uh, the uh, brotherhood of uh, wisdom and compassion, which uh, always is able, again and again and again, to give an inspiring influence and which takes the form of a new religion, which has a kind of, uh, yeah, you can say, a body of the universal wisdom. And, uh, uh, yeah, and it is able to do that infinitely, again and again. So that was a, a kind of analogy which uh, we thought about uh, stem cells. Um, I also have a question um, uh, about the stem cells. In, if you try to explain it from the point of view of consciousness. Um, can you also make an analogy? Uh, you also showed the slides, uh, and I'm in control of that, so that's nice. <laughs> I can directly show it. Uh, the first few slides, uh, let me see, um, where you have a, a repu uh, how do you say, a germ cell? A reproductive cell, um, which is the first focal point of uh, consciousness um, um, reincarnating itself again um, on the physical uh, uh, stage. And then you have this um, division into more cells, and then you have a division in even more cells that you can make an analogy also with, like. Um, for instance, um, a cosmological, um, uh, how do you say, uh, a birth of a planet, for instance, with the Laia point, and then maybe 
the first, um, how do you say, the the the, 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 yeah, the first emanations. So that stem cells really are uh, a very high on the hierarchy, um, but then in this on this physical level. So can you make that analogy? That's the question. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would say that's accurate, Irvin. Um, it's uh, on the physical level, on this physical plane, it's probably, again, the highest aspect of whatever stem cell that is or whatever, animal or human or whatever. Uh, so again, everything, uh, the bottom line is that everything that is here comes from a higher or at least a different level of consciousness and energy, energy and matter, which is beyond our senses. Uh, and uh, so it, nothing originates here, and that's why, again, physical illnesses, et cetera, et cetera, are, are dangerous to block or suppress because it's, it's, if one has certain mental, emotional, or psychological, ethical problems, it's the natural tendency to work these down eventually to the physical and to get rid of them that way and blocking them by whatever process that could suppress it, be it medication, I'm sorry, hypnosis also, and other, other types of treatments, frankly, can uh, cause this illness to be suppressed and driven upward. And definitely, again, uh, uh, there's always that relationship. So you had a question? One point in the discussion about the ethical side uh, we have something to add, not so many other organizations have. Uh, we talk about the reincarnating human being, the reincarnating ego, and that is the third part in the combination parents-child. A child doesn't exist. There are three uh, totally on the same level uh, individuals, uh, two already born and one uh, trying to be born, uh, and we call that a child, but that is a mistake. And the cells in the body of men and uh, women are not their own cells. The productive cells are cells given in their care, but are really the cells of the reincarnating egos waiting to be able to be born. And if you see that, then when a woman says, oh, come on, in vitro, and they have, you said, 40,000 cells used for that process, and uh, only one is successful. You said 40,000? 400,000 in vitro embryos. Yes. Over America, or of one woman. No, no, no. But even the eggs you give to that doctor are not your cells. They're from reincarnating egos. So the whole discussion of that poor unborn child goes much farther because you give cells that are not yours. If my hair falls out, uh, is that a normal English word? If I lose hairs, I can knit a scarf of it. I can do an, uh, make a wig or something. But if I give uh, egg cells or s sperm cells, they are not mine. And uh, even then, you can't use them. You know, uh, they are given in your care. And that is more than most Christian uh, organizations can tell you. Um, yes, there's much more, there's much deeper aspects to the egg and the uh, sperm, as uh, Johanna was saying. Uh, the parents really are just, you might say, uh, certain vehicles that are necessary for this uh, egg and germ or embryo to develop, but the real the real is brought from, again, the higher planes. Uh, eventually, of course, the higher above us is the astral, but even higher. And 
it is the one, this is, and past karma is the one that really deals with development of this embryo. Uh, so I think that's a very important point. It's somewhat uh, technical and abstruse as to how much this is done because, but I think uh, you're hitting on a very important point. Thank you. It, it might be an issue of language, but um, my understanding is that life is in potential in having these these eggs and the, the potential for life is there. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a soul waiting to incarnate. I, I think souls, we, we travel in groups, you know, each soul has a soul group of, I don't know, a thousand or fifteen hundred, and we work out our karma together over many lifetimes. And I think that a soul is, looks for parents that may, be, may or may not be in that soul group, but that will provide them with the right vehicle for expression in a lifetime, whether it's the right physical ve vehicle, personality, mental, all of these other things which are bodies of expression for the soul. And it's the process in which the soul expresses itself and learns. So uh, I, I, it may be language, maybe we're saying the same thing, maybe we're not, but um, that's my understanding. That is the normal understanding of the process of birth. But theosophy gives more and says that parents don't provide the opportunity, but the parents carry within themselves the opportunities of the reincarnating ego. We don't provide anything to other uh, reincarnating egos when we give birth. Uh, but we are carrying their instruments. Yes? Okay. I have a third viewpoint. No, I'm just... <laughs> too complex. Um... And there's a big language problem, so I think. So uh, maybe I'll try and back up. I'm not sure. So what is it that, you know, sometimes in very, what I would call, uh, I would call simplistic, Viewpoint, oh, I choose my parents. Well, where was the I to choose? Dreaming. So I don't think it's not like that, you know. So, uh, so, at the same time, it's as if it's much more of a, you know, we have to take it out of this linear way of thinking. So it's as if harmonics, harmonics, you know, similar harmonics attract uh, in very subtle and complex ways, you know. And I, I don't think that we can say it's causal in any direction. Like uh, this makes that happen in terms of a human incarnation, from a subtle level, spiritual level to physical level. It's not like, uh, I'm not sure this is making sense, but it's not like, uh, oh yes, I'm going to go there because that gives me this lesson to do this, to get that, da 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 da. It doesn't, doesn't uh, wouldn't satisfy my, my feelings and intuition and thinking. You know, it's much more or organic and much more harmonic and that it has to be this one or that one. It's not doesn't have to be, you know, I just don't think so. It can go in many, it's much more of a fluid, you know, our karma is enormous over millions of years, you know, it can take enormous, multiple different forms at different times in terms of its expression in a given incarnation. It doesn't have to land here or there. That's just my thought, anyway.
if I sounded that, if, if you're responding to what I said, um, no, I oh, okay. <laughs> No. Oh, I'm <laughs> yeah. Um, then I have nothing to say <laughs> because that's not. If I thought he was responding to me, I'm like, but that's not what I was meaning to say. Um, but you were not understood. My mistake. You can edit that out of the footage. Thanks, Ken, when I can't find the right words. No. No. Um, another point, Loma Convivium. We take up the sweat. No. Uh, I don't meant uh, to explain it from the standpoint of the reincarnating ego. For that reincarnating ego doesn't choose at all. That is in quite another uh, process. But we, as parents, in Spay, we have to see uh, what happens, and we have our responsibilities, and we can make wiser choices when we know that those germ cells are not our private cells, they are not ours. And that gives quite another way of choosing. Yes, we are not, uh, we cannot say, oh, we take 10 or 20 or 100 cells and give it to the in vitro wizard, uh, but uh, we have to think about that. And the reincarnating ego, how that works, that's uh, uh, two uh, volumes, uh, 11 and 12, of our series. I think, uh, uh, Johanna, this is a commitment for you then, to speed up. <laughs> okay, oh, well, I, I think I, I agree with uh, Ken, uh, that if you think about building relations for uh, choosing parents, and this choosing parents is, let's say, a very short turn in the whole process, because if you realize how many karmic relations you build with other people around you, doing it over the many uh, incarnations you have already in the past, that it, it is more working in the way what is the right opportunity on a particular moment, because I think that if you go far back enough, you have almost a uh, relation with everybody else on this world, so uh, on this earth. So I think that that process is a little bit, uh, well, let's say, more complex, more much more factors play a role in it. But I think we should realize it is karmic in the first place. And we build it ourselves. So I think that is uh, for me a an, an most clear thing. But I think if you look along that line, you can maybe choose about, uh, well, let's say 100, 200 parents. Because you have it all different, uh, you have a relation with them. And on one moment in time, this one giving good opportunity, uh, maybe a half, year, half year later, another one given an opportunity, and so on. So I think it is in a certain way much more flexible. But having the microphone, I make use of the fact now <laughs> that we already uh, on the end of the evening. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Richard and Hank very much, because in the first... Yeah. I think you both show in the discussion that this is a subject what is going very deep and wide. And uh, certainly we can come back on that. Especially if science come up with some other uh, what I called good ideas. So, and of course the uh, responsibility from uh, let's say mental point of view is tremendous. If you start thinking what the effects karmic can be from all that uh, actions they do, then I think you should sometimes reconsider the choices, yeah? So, thank you very much. Um, okay, we are uh, on the end, I think, for our first... Uh